Hello and welcome. You're watching to the point. The Prime Minister has promised that the perpetrators of the Uri attack will not go unpunished. The Home Minister has called Pakistan a terrorist state. BJP General Secretary Ram Madhav has said for one truth, the country will seek the complete joke and added that restraint in the face of repeated terror attacks betrays inefficiency and incompetence. Clearly the government has signaled there will be a military response. So tonight we does discuss what sort of response could that be? Will it lead to retaliation by Pakistan? And is the risk of ex escalation reason to pause and think again or plan very carefully? My guests are two former army chiefs, the victor of the Kargil War, General V.P. Malik, and the last and former army chief, General Bikram Singh, former foreign secretary, Krishnan Srinivasan, former high commissioner to Pakistan, G. Partha Sarthi, and the strategic affairs editor of the Business Standard, Ajay Shukla. General Malik, there's a lot of public pressure on the government to respond militarily to the Uri terror attack. Now, since the Modi government came to power two years ago, India has stepped up its artillery and heavy mortar firing across the LOC to target Pakistani pickets that facilitate infiltration. But that didn't prevent Pathan Court and it didn't pre uh, prevent Uri. So clearly, a stepped up response is required. Can you briefly sketch out the different types of responses that can be considered? You see, firstly, uh, Karan, I must say that um, looking at the history of cross-border terrorism which has been going on and also uh, looking at the kind of responses which have been made or not made by India and uh, that they have, not, uh, uh, they have not worked at all, I think uh, it is time for us now to do something different which we have not done earlier. And therefore, I feel that some kind of a response has become necessary uh, currently. Uh, if you don't do it, it is going to encourage Pakistan even more, and they will try even more such stunts. And uh, also, of course, uh, it's a question of our own domestic uh, people. They will, they will not like if there is no response at all. What sort now, of response there, are you talking about? Yes, yeah, there are many kinds of responses which can be made. There are... Uh, it is a possible for us to. It is possible for us to carry out uh, covert activities across the border or line of control. It is also possible for us to carry out certain punitive activity below a certain threshold, keeping in mind that there is a graduated response, and we'll have to monitor that response. I'm not suggesting that we go the way Pakistan did during Kargil War because they had taken us on on a 160 kilometer front, but we can do these kind of things at different places at a slightly lower level, uh, depending upon the kind of impact that you want to make. But one thing I want to say uh, absolutely essential, and that is that there should be no knee-jerk uh, reaction. It should be well thought out okay. reaction, and uh, it should be uh, well timed. Okay. You can't uh, delay too late, but it, it should be well timed and uh, uh, something that can have an impact. If it is not going to have an impact, then there is no point in having that kind of an action. General Bikram Singh, two sorts of responses that are being discussed are the following. Firstly, some form of cross-border hot pursuit. And secondly, there is some talk of surgically targeted airstrikes. Would you say that at this moment of time, Perhaps surgically targeted airstrikes might be one step too far? Yes, uh, Karan, I, I personally feel that, you know, we, we need to actually understand what's the kind of political end state we are looking at. You see, the moment you take the use of force slightly one or two notches above than what we are doing at the moment, incidentally what General uh, Malik brought out, this is uh, the activity that has been going on for a number of years. We've been launching fire assaults, we've been launching uh, you know, trans-LC operations within the technical range. That's in the close proximity of the line of control. It's been going on. But uh, as uh, he brought out, I think if we have to do something worthwhile, we have to do something more than what has been done hitherto. But uh, at this juncture, crossing over the line of control, using your air power or long-range missiles, then we've got to ensure that we manage the risk. We carry out contingency planning and we are well guarded to ensure that in case there is escalation, we are fully prepared to take on that escalation and not found wanting. 
That's a very clear answer. Let me bring you in, Mr. Pasa Sarsi. Whether it's cross-border hot pursuit or whether it's targeted airstrikes or whether it's some other form of carefully calculated action that is across the LOC, I presume in each of these events the target would be terrorist training camps. But the question is, do we first of all have a precise idea of their location? And secondly, given that these camps often comprise nothing more than just a few tents, I imagine there's a good chance that they can up sticks and disappear very quickly. Oh, absolutely. This uh, question of hitting terrorist uh, camps has been thought of in the, uh, and, uh, and really it has not yield. Look, Karan, I don't want to go into the details of it, but I do believe that any response has to be measured, calculated and effective. Taking into account, uh, this, even when doing it, the uh, uh, steps up the escalatory ladder, because it will, it will not stop at that. But we should be very clear. One final point. I don't buy this Pakistani bluff of things going nuclear. The Pakistan army lives too comfortably. They're too well off to go nuclear. But come back to this talk of terrorist training camps because mm. we often hear mm. that there are 40, 44, sometimes 55. Mm. Do they exist in permanent places that we can identify? Not, and not, not, well, some are, some are, to my knowledge. And my knowledge is rather old. But the fact of, fact of the matter is they're uh, hitting them unless it's a terrorist staging area. There's a difference from a terrorist... So they're not good targets for us to look at? I'm, 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 but a staging area, yes, if you can pull out point one and hit them when they're staging. Yeah. But otherwise they're not credible targets for us to look at? I don't think so. I just Shukla, whether it's cross-border hot pursuit or whether it's surgically targeted airstrikes, I presume in either event Pakistan will respond. What are the chances that its response will be a stepped-up response which would escalate the problem. Uh, just to, to sort of get the figures clear, according to a latest uh, Credit Suisse ranking, Pakistan has the 11th most powerful military in the world. We have the 4th most powerful military. Uh, that is not such a big difference. So Pakistan does have the ability to escalate it has the ability to protect its turf, its territory, its airspace. So we are not like a country like, let's say, Israel, which can ride roughshod over its neighbors and launch attacks whenever it feels like. In our case, there is going to be a cost. There is going to be an escalation. And there's a whole theory of escalation, Karan. Uh, the theory of escalation is that as you move one step up the escalation ladder, you have to have dominance at every step of the ladder. For example, if we decide to strike uh, a terrorist training camp and Pakistan decides to hit back at one of our military units, we should be able to dominate that exchange of hitting each other's military units. Similarly, you must be able to dominate every step up the escalation ladder. Now this requires careful planning. It is something we have not done in India. You need uh, the planning levels to sit down. Okay. You need the military chiefs, you need the national security advisor, you need the foreign secretary to handle international uh, repercussions and so on. You don't start all of this when a uh, crisis arises. You do all this beforehand. Okay. You have the options ready prepared, the troops earmarked, rehearsed in their contingency tasks. We are waiting until you actually get struck. And then we are talking about strike options and creating the options to hit back. So we are already many steps behind the curve uh, when okay. it comes to that. But I, I just want to make one point clear over here before I allow the other speakers to get, to get on with what they are saying. And that is this business of striking terrorist camps is a complete chimera. It's a bogey. <laughs> we can't strike terrorist camps because they are a shifting target. They are here today, gone tomorrow. Let's be clear. If we want to strike, that is actually we what Ambassador Partha Sarthi said. Which is hurting us, and Ajay, that is the Pakistan. Ajay, that is exactly what Ambassador Partha Sarthi said. The terrorist camps the are Pakistan not credible Army. targets. They don't exist in big numbers. They I'm shift, in. and they are not worth pursuing. Trishan Srinivasan, you're a former foreign secretary. If we Which take is action, why you have to strike the terrorist okay. army. Trishan Srinivasan, you're a former foreign secretary. If we take action, and then Pakistan responds. Will it end with that tit for tat, with the Indian government then saying we've done what we had to do? Or will the Indian government then be under public pressure, maybe it's even its own internal pressure, to respond yet again? Thus, slowly but steadily going up the escalatory ladder. 
Yes, of course, that is, that is the greatest danger. And uh, in a way, frankly, um, the fact that we're discussing this, and it's a matter for uh, political and uh, domestic debate, suggests that we're already too late. Because if we're going to have a response, it should be instantaneous, and it should have been prepared in advance. It, it, I'm sure it, some thinking has gone into this already, but, uh, you know, um, the, the longer you wait, the fewer your options uh, and the greater your limitations. So, uh, yes, I think uh, if, if uh, maybe revenge is a dish best served cold, uh, then I think we need, I mean, I'm not an expert, and you have experts on your panel, but I'd say that the response has to be completely different now. I think it has to be commensurate, certainly, but it also has to be deniable. And in the same way as Pakistan is, uh, is denying uh, their terror attacks, so we should have deniability. And um, I think we need to understand also very clearly that no, end of resp uh, no amount of response on our side is going to stop Pakistan okay. from engaging in terror attacks on India. So mm -hmm. it is only going to be for... Uh, military and domestic morale that we, we that we will be doing this and let, when let, we come to let, can, can I stop you response, uh, sorry can, can I stop you there I want to take up with General Malik the point you made that we may need a different type of response it needs to be one that is deniable and there was a point General Malik made by one of your predecessors General Shankar Roy Chaudhary on television last night when he said that India needs to develop its own non-state actors he said India needs to develop its own Hafiz Saeed, its own Fedayeen squads. Now that would be a very different way of responding to what Pakistan has done compared to what we've discussed so far. <coughs> but would it be advisable or would it be a mistake? Would it be too much like borrowing Pakistan's own weapon and using it back against Pakistan? Karan, uh, you know, we had some capabilities uh, till about mid-90s. Yeah. But then we ourselves decided to do away with it uh, because of political directions that were given to us. And now in order to create that kind of uh, uh, capability, it's going to take very long time. It cannot be done all of a sudden. So as far as that covert operations are concerned, I call them covert operations, at the moment it is totally out of question. So at the moment, the only response we have if we choose to militarily respond is to use the army and to use it as you identified for some form of either covert action or cross-border hot pursuit or perhaps if it's so thought necessary targeted airstrikes. We have to stick to conventional responses. Have I understood that correctly General Malik? Yes, uh, what I am saying is that you know uh, there is a possibility we can do some things we have some kind of contingency plans and if they can be utilized, if they can be made use of so long as, as everybody said, that we control the escalatory ladder. And That's controlling true. the escalatory ladder is not just military action. It is a political, diplomatic, as well as a military action. And we have to keep watching that carefully. And we have to achieve what surprise, deception, when we want to do that. Okay. So that kind of capability, I do believe, exists with us. If we all work in a coordinated fashion, as we did during Kargil War. Kargil war was much bigger, but we can do something like that at a, at a lower level, at a smaller uh, frontage. General Bikram Singh, one of the things that emerges from our discussion so far is that whether we talk about some form of cross-border hot pursuit or whether we talk about targeted airstrikes, which many people think may not be necessary or even desirable at this point of time. But my point is this, whatever we talk about, there is a real risk that it could lead to escalation. And that risk has to be factored in before you take the action. In other words, a lot of careful thinking needs to be undergone before you decide on A, whether there should be a military option, and B, what that option should be. The risk has to be factored in because there is no military option that is risk-free. Have I understood correctly? Yeah, um, Karan, uh, before I answer this question of yours, let me just clarify two earlier issues, uh, which uh, one is by Ajay Shukla, Colonel Ajay Shukla. Uh, this is with regard to, he saying that, you know, uh, we, we perhaps don't have comprehensive plans. 
Let me tell you, as a former chief, we have very comprehensive, exhaustive, well-coordinated plans. It has just been the political will. Okay, uh, the political will actually has been immense now. It's very clear. The government has made very strong statements. And let me tell you, uh, we have a very professional military. Okay. Uh, he's been part of that. We have very, very comprehensive plans for all contingency. Let me tell you, in the entire spectrum of conflict, number one. Number two, just a word about uh, what you talked about, creating own non-state actors. You see, let's be very clear. Let's see the example of Pakistan, what they did as far as the anti-Soviet operations were concerned in Afghanistan. Uh, they created this resource, which turned out to be a double-edged weapon, a double-edged sword, which is even inflicting thousand cuts on them today. Uh, so let's not go in for something which is unaccountable, which tomorrow becomes a monster, uh, which starts uh, questioning the writ of the government, uh, rule of law, and starts, you know, dictating terms to the government. We should not create this capability, yet, yet, we can create this capability across the line of control by using other means, okay. by using our intelligence resources, by throwing in money, pumping in money. There, are, there is tremendous amount of disaffection today in large sections of the population, uh, population which is uh, uh, poverty-stricken, Money would play a handsome role over there. Okay. And this has been done in the past. It can be done. The other thing is, G as part Malik, of our overall Malik, strategy, G G let's not thing. just look at... Come, come, back, you know. come back, come back, come back, sir, to the point I made. Yeah. Whatever just the, the options are, am I right in saying that there is no risk-free option? And therefore, before you decide whether there should be a military option and then what that option should be, the government must factor in the risks and do so very carefully. Yes. Of course, Karan current, the, the SWOT analysis, the risk management is something which is paramount in this kind of operations. But what I wish to tell you is that let's adopt a kindly a different approach, a strategy of indirect approach, which has to a large extent been highlighted by the Honorable Prime Minister when he talked about Balochistan. You know, let's get the Pakistani army embroiled in its domestic scene. Yes, sir. Let sir, the but Pakistani army bleed by thousand cuts. General Bikram Singh, before we situation. come to other options That's which are not military, strategy. let's first stick to but the yes. military ones. I'll, I'll come to other options later because you're veering away now. Yes, but all military uh, options... Yeah, finish your point. All no, military current, options. no, I'm not. Current, the point is that if you're using military options, you've got to manage the risk, and the risk management is part and parcel of every plan. Now, one of the interesting things that General Bikram Singh, Mr. Parthasarthi, has made clear, and I underline for the audience that he is the previous army chief. It's just over two years since he retired. His knowledge of preparedness and plans would be greater than that of anyone other than the sitting army chief. And he says India has very detailed, comprehensive plans for the whole spectrum of military options that are theoretically open to the country. That means that theoretically and in terms of planning, we are ready. As he said, it's a matter of political will. The readiness that people are talking about, that work is done. Uh, Karan, we are talking to this in a vacuum. Let's be clear of the strategic situation Pakistan is in. Pakistan today has 200,000 troops deployed in Balochistan and in, in the frontier province. It has driven 800,000 people out of their homes. There is a thriving insurgency across the Durand line which Afghanistan does not, uh, does not uh, recognize. I think the first step we should be doing, really, is turning its attention westwards. Perhaps, perhaps uh, agree with Afghanistan that the Durand line is, a, is, is not, uh, not a frontier. But that's not any longer a military response. No, no, just, Those just, just, just a minute. Other sort of responses, just, 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 just financing a, that, 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 that has a military ap implication to it because of the disposition of the Pakistan army. Let's be very, very clear. They're totally tied up there. But, Secondly... But, 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 but can, I, can, I, can I stop you there? That's not what the government is contemplating as a first Just a minute. What, you, what makes you think that's not what they Because of the talk that is emanating through sources. Exactly. I, I never take talk alone okay. in such situations. But, but, but you're slightly going off the subject. No, 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 no. Just a minute. You are controlling the subject. Let me complete. I'm saying that uh, I agree with General Bikram Singh that they have a range of options that they have a proper uh, understanding of uh, escalation control. But remember, the advantage we have today, much more than what we had in General Bikram Singh's time, is the strategic uh, environment okay. surrounding Pakistan. Let me go back to you, Karan Shukla, before I take a break. One of the things that General Bikram Singh has revealed, and as I underlined for the audience, he is the former army chief. 
He has only retired two years ago and he will have perhaps a better knowledge of India's preparedness and India's plans than anyone other than the present army chief. And he says, we have detailed plans covering the full spectrum of potential military options. And that to me suggests that it's only a matter, as General Bikram Singh says, of political will. The preparedness is there. Therefore, if the government chooses, a whole range of options have been worked out. And I suppose that includes cross-border, hot pursuit, targeted military strikes and everything else. This is very different to what you were saying. Everything. Uh, Karan, I think uh, General Vikram Singh is applying a more liberal description or a liberal interpretation of what constitutes an option. Uh, if there were options, I would assume that by now the government would have exercised those options rather than having the Director General of Military Operations come out today and say, we reserve the right to re retaliate at a place and point of our own choosing. What General Bikram Singh appears to be saying is that they've already had made those choices, made those planning choices. Why then is the Director no, General of Military right. Operations saying we reserve the right uh, and in effect okay. warning Pakistan about an impending attack? Uh, so I simply don't believe. Can it I can I stop you? General Bikram Singh has put up his the, hand. I think he wants to answer that PM particular point. Want to conclude. Both General Malik and General Bikram Singh have put up their hands. First, you, General Malik, go ahead. You know, I don't think we should get involved in semantics. What General Bikram Singh is saying is that we have contingency plans for all kinds of contingencies, but what is required finally is the political will and political orders. So these are contingency plans we are talking of. Some may take 24 hours, some may take three days, two days. But let's not get involved in, in semantics of uh, what the DGMO said that day and uh, try and uh, understand each word that he said. Very quickly, General Bikram Singh, before I take a break. You are confirming that we have detailed contingency plans for a whole spectrum of military options and it's simply a matter of political will, not that we are unprepared and not ready. Can you confirm that? Yes, we, we, we absolutely we have those options. And, uh, you know, just replying to uh, Ajay Shukla's point, uh, he, he has made a very valid point, but it needs to be understood that surprise and deception are two very, very important principles in the use of force. Now, we have lost the surprise. Pakistan knows that we will be doing something now. They would be ready. So therefore, what the DGM has brought out is time and place of, uh, of our choosing to keep the adversary guessing so that we can use, unfold our plans when required after the nod is given by the political masters and we go ahead. Options, all contingency plans, as General Malik said, they are very much there. All right, gentlemen, let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to turn to what then are the risk factors? To what extent does Pakistan have a, a fighting force that we need to be careful and thoughtful of because it's not one that we dominate in such a vast capacity that we should be unconcerned about the response. What about the situation in the valley? Should that give us cause for thought? Because the army could suddenly find that its hinterland is not supporting it but might be opposing it. And finally, what about the political will? Does it exist or is it only a question of talking big but acting small? Join me in a moment's time for the second part of this important discussion. Welcome back. You're watching To The Point. We are discussing the sort of military options that are open to India if India wants to respond to the Uri terror attack. Let's come now to what I call the risk factors. General Bikram Singh, newspapers and television discussions often cite the example of Israel and how it immediately responds to any Palestinian or Hamas terror attack. But of course, the Pakistan army is not Hamas. And let's be honest, politically, we are nothing like Israel either. To what extent do we need to factor in the fact that Pakistan has a pretty effective fighting machine and in many respects their army is as good as ours? To what extent does that need to be factored in? Look, uh, as far as the competence of your adversary is concerned, Chanak Chanakya Niti tells you as per Arthra Shastra that never underestimate your adversary, number one. So uh, we, whenever we deal with the enemy, with the adversary, we've got to give the due to the, to the devil. That's one. Number two, uh, uh, when you talked about Israel, I was there in Israel on an official visit, I remember, in March 2014. 
And there was an attack by Hamas, which was retaliated at that very night, I remember. I was invited for dinner by their chief. But the chief had to leave the uh, dinner, and uh, he apologized for it, and they went in, you know, as far as Hamas was concerned. I think ultimately we've got to create that capability. But okay. along with this, when you develop a capability of this kind, you've got to ruggedize your own areas, your civil installations, your sure, other sir. establishments, your border areas. They've got to be ruggedized. They've got to be hardened so that they are not victim to the okay. onslaught. Once you engage the enemy and he fires onto you, we should not suffer. And that is something which has got to be taken note of. General Malik, a second potential risk factor is the fact that at the moment, the Kashmir Valley is going through one of the most disturbed periods it's ever been through since independence. You had regular protests for 75 days, nearly 75 deaths, maybe by some counts even 81 or 82 over 10,000 including security forces injured. To what extent does the army need to bear this in mind when it considers some sort of stepped up response to Pakistan? Because it means that the hinterland may not be totally in terms of sentiment supporting the army. Look, we will have to secure our uh, supply chain, there is no doubt about it. And uh, we will require some extra troops uh, in ensuring that. But let me also tell you, my own experience has been that whenever India and Pakistan have been fighting on the border, the valley has gone quiet. It happened during Kargil War, it has happened later, earlier also. So while we have to take all those precautions of ensuring security of lines of communication, but my own feeling is that people in the valley are not going to create further trouble. Krishna Srinivasan, what about China? We know that there is a sizable Chinese presence in POK. Some reports even talk about the presence of Chinese soldiers, but those reports may not be confirmed. If India were to target specific installations in POK, be they terror camps, which are often movable, or be they some form of infrastructure targets, what are the ch chances that China might feel a need to get involved and respond? And do we need to bear that in mind? I don't think they'll feel, I don't think they'll feel the need to get involved uh, if the strikes are distant from where the Chinese, uh, where the Chinese presence is. So I don't think that's uh, necessarily a relevant factor. Uh, when I spoke of uh, having deniability uh, in, um, in responding to Pakistan, of course, I didn't mean necessarily only in POK. Oh, then can you spell out a bit more what you meant by deniability in slightly greater detail? Well, it's detail. difficult to spell these things out. Uh, as you know, there are people who are well informed about these things, much more than I am. But I would say that uh, we do probably have the capability and the capacity to uh, engage in a deniable activity in Pakistan that can cause grief there. And I think that uh, this is the right time to do it, because uh, uh, in the same way as... Uh, uh, Pakistan claims, despite evidence to the contrary, they're quite uh, uh, innocent in the matter. I think we should do the same. This would, this would also have the benefit of not inviting a military response. Very quickly, therefore, you're saying that the fear or the risk of the Chinese wanting to involve themselves because of their presence in POK is not a fear we need to worry too much about because they won't involve themselves unless they are directly hit. Hitting infrastructure targets exactly. where they're not yes, involved this is, this or hitting exactly terror camps won't, invoke, won't provoke the Chinese. I'm quite sure we know where the Chinese uh, um, uh, uh, people are in POK and I, I'm perfectly sure that we can avoid it if, if it comes to that. Very quickly, do you believe the political will exists? It's been exhibited in the terms of the rhetoric we've heard either from the PM, the Home Minister or Ramadha. But rhetoric is one thing, action is another. Does that will exist? I would put it rather indirectly and, and diplomatically, which is unlike me, that since the last two years, Pakistan is becoming very uncomfortable inside its own country. So yes, a set, uh, if, if the army feels it can be done and it needs to be done, yes, measured, even plausibly deniable cross-border raids by the military is fine. But the larger weapon to deal with Pakistan and its misbehavior exists with us, especially as they are fighting on two fronts. Adi Shukla, your view through the show was very different to that of the two army chiefs. I want to ask you a simple question. Assuming the political will exist and the rhetoric we've heard from the PM, the Home Minister and Ram Madhav is real talk and not just hot talk, 
would you be happy or would you be worried if the army were ordered by their political bosses to undertake whatever military response is deemed appropriate? Uh, it depends on what the military response is. If it's a strike against some terror camp that perhaps doesn't exist at all, uh, and is just a cosmetic strike that is designed to placate public opinion in India, I, would, I wouldn't be happy with that. Uh, nor am I of the viewpoint that says we must have deniability in our attack. The whole purpose of an attack is to avoid deniability, to send the clear message that you're retaliating against a particular thing, and to strike the target that is directly behind okay. all of this, which is the Pakistan army. So I believe that we need to be a lot more forthright, a lot less deniable, a lot more hard-hitting uh, about this. And we need to react now. We don't need to react at a time and place of our own choosing when the entire game has gotten over and we've forgotten what we are doing. Very quickly, General Malik, is there a sense in which speed of response is important? Which is what Ajay Shukla is suggesting? Is there a sense in which deniability is important, which is what Krishnan Srinivasan is suggesting, or can we choose our time and place? And secondly, should we react whenever we want and not worry about deniability? Both of those together, but quickly, sir. Look, if we have the capability of doing something which can make an impact and we can deny it, uh, that I think is a good option, no doubt about that. But I have my doubts about that kind of capability. As far as retaliation is concerned, yes, it must be at a time of our own choosing, though it cannot be very late. But it must have an impact. If it is not going to have an impact, and people think that it is all right, one strike from our side, and it has made no impact, then it is of no use. All right. In other words, it has to be successful. If it happens, it mustn't be ineffectual. General Bikram Singh, how confident are you that whatever we do, if we do it, will be successful and not ineffectual? Because remember, what's ineffectual would also be embarrassing. Literally 10 seconds, sir. You see, current, let's look at the entire initiative as aimed at, you know, asserting our will on Pakistan to stop nurturing and exporting terror to India. I mean, that's, that's the end state we should be looking at. And if we have to assert our will on Pakistan, then it cannot just be a military alone doing this. Yes. It has got to be a multi-pronged initiative, That's an integrated I strategy which has to be unfolded, which has been brought out by Ambassador Patasarthi, that we, we need to actually isolate Pakistan diplomatically, okay. economically, uh, give it the punishment, uh, informationally, uh, at the international level isolated. All, right, sir. All these activities have to go on. And I think we've got to learn a lesson from Parakram. In Parakram, are we going to, have to, have to stop with there, sir? I've run out of time, but you're making an important point, which is that the military response, if it happens, has to be part of a bigger package of economic, diplomatic and political responses. It mustn't be done in isolation. But the important point I want to end with is, if there is a military response, it must be successful. It mustn't end up being ineffectual, because that could prove to be embarrassing. My thanks to all my guests for joining me. To have been thanks for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye.